Welcome to our Discovery to Author event. I'm Lisa, I'm the Reader Development Librarian for Suffolk Libraries and this evening I'm so pleased to introduce author Martin Walker. Welcome Martin, thank you so much for joining us. Well hello everybody, it's a pleasure to be uh, to be with you if only electronically and thank you very much for having me on. It's wonderful that we've got all this technology to be able to do these things, I think it's just fantastic. Well, first off, Martin, I wanted to ask you, like, before becoming an author, you spent many years obviously working as a journalist. Did you find that that helped or hindered you moving into becoming a, an author of books? Well, I, th I think it helped for, for two main reasons. The first was that I just got used to writing something every day. And uh, when you're writing under a deadline for a daily newspaper, and I was with The Guardian for many years, then you just have to get on with it. In fact, there's an old motto of Fleet Street, which used to be the center of British journalism, which was, don't get it right, get it written. There's a hole to be filled yeah. in paper. So that was one thing that, uh, that was helpful. The other was that because of my journalism, and I was the Guardian's correspondent in Moscow throughout the Gorbachev time, and then in the USA with Bush and Clinton, um, I wrote several nonfiction books. Uh, about politics and international affairs, a book about Gorbachev, a book about Clinton, a history of the Cold War. And so I, I was not intimidated by the thought of writing a book. And, um, and when I first began visiting this part of the world, um, I was just blown away by the, the, the caves, the prehistoric caves like Lascaux. Because most of what we know about prehistoric people, Neanderthals, the Cro-Magnons, uh, comes from this valley of the Vizier where I where I'm now living, and it's um, it's the famous Lascaux cave with this extraordinarily cave art of people of eighteen thousand years ago, and so I wrote a novel called The Caves of Perigord, which was about a sort of mixture of that time when what kind of society could have produced this masterpiece, and at the same time the same region in nineteen forty four, the summer of D Day, the summer of the liberation of France and the role of the resistance and bringing all that together into into a novel and I had great fun writing that and then I um, through my local tennis club and rugby club here in my village in France I got to know a, a really nice guy we we had this system of on Friday mornings a bunch of us would gather at the tennis club men of a certain age and with the kind of tennis where you'd have a glass of wine down by the side of the net and we'd play a hour and a half of doubles then we'd have lunch and we'd make lunch in the tennis club and being a French tennis club the kitchen was an enormous and well stocked place and we would prepare our own lunch there and we'd bring along our wines and our cheeses and uh, and so on and one of the guys who was a regular was a man called uh, Pierrot who had spent 10 years in the French army and who um, in his spare time taught the local kids to play tennis in the summer and rugby in the winter and he was a keen hunter a very good cook and uh, he was our village policeman and I thought this is a really interesting guy around whom I could write a book but then I've got to work out hmm how do I write a crime novel so off we went was he your original inspiration for Bruno for the whole series? He was in a way the inspiration for Bruno, but it wasn't just him. It was also the rest of the of the neighborhood and the surroundings. So there is there's an awful lot of, of real people and real place in my novel. So um, there is the Baron, who is my, was my neighbor. He's a regular character. He was also part of our, our Friday uh, Friday tennis. There is Raymond, the retired gendarme, who uh, became Jean-Jacques in the in the novels, was a very good friend. Um, the, the most of the mayor was really modelled upon uh, two of the first mayors I knew, and the one thing I've never tried to base upon a real person uh, is any of the female characters. I just have to make those up um, because I otherwise I'd be just appalled if my wife or my uh, of my sister-in-law or my daughters thought uh-oh he's putting That's us in the, in the book, book. He's, he's used me as a character 
but it's it's wonderful that you know like all the men that you've mentioned that you've used and, and taken from as characters in the book in your whole series that you have that that network of neighbors and friends where you've got these these rich ideas and obviously in your latest book martin the coldest case the the original spark i believe came again from a neighbor and friend and a real life case that they had told you about would you tell our audience about that Yes, it's, it's this friend of mine, Raymond, and um, most evenings at about 6.30, he and I will meet for a petit apéro, a little uh, evening drink. And when I go visiting the vineyards, Raymond normally comes with me. He's a man in his late 70s. He was for many years um, a captain of gendarme um, in uh, various parts of France. He was part of the bodyguards group for uh, President Jacques Chirac, when Chirac was the Prime Minister. Um, he spent five years on secondment to the French security services. He has a host of stories, most of which I've heard over these little apéro evening drinks. And one case that always haunted him, he called him Oscar. And I first noticed that on the wall of his, of his house, he had this photograph of a skull, and that was Oscar. It was his first case as a just a fresh out of detective school for the gendarmerie. And um, there was a, a body found in the woods. Body was uh, been there for about a year. It was clearly, uh, clearly beginning to decompose in a serious way, but no evidence of who it might be. No ID, no clothes you could identify. And so Raymond had this job of trying to find out who on earth this person might be. And pretty much what happened in the book is what actually Raymond tried to do to establish how the guy had been killed. Because he'd, he'd gone through in the post-mortem, the body trying to find a bullet or the sign of a knife wound, a scratch upon a rib. And finally, um, he, he boiled the head in order to get the, the, uh, the flesh off so he could see that there had been a blow to the head. And he had identified the weapon. It was a camping, a kind of a camping tool but he never identified the guy. But of course, this was the time long before DNA. Mm. And um, so now it might be possible to do that. So this had always been in my mind as a, a possible idea. And then in our, local, uh, in, in our local museum, which is the French National Museum of Prehistory, and it is one of the great museums of the world, it's probably got more finds of our remote ancestors than anywhere else. And they organized uh, a very special exhibition by a woman called Elizabeth Dainess. And if you ever saw that uh, exhibition of Tutankhamun and the recreation of his yes. face from the skull, that's the woman who did it. And I thought, aha, aha, if you can recreate a face from a skull, what does that mean for Oscar? And boom, boom off we went i had a the basis of a story and i knew enough from the from my time in journalism in the cold war and my history of the cold war i could sort of bring this in to events 30 years ago and um and there i was i had uh, the makings of a novel brilliant well this just seems like a perfect time if you're happy to martin to do a reading from um your latest book okay right from the uh from the coldest case. The three skulls transfixed him. The first, the original that had been unearthed after 70,000 years was not quite complete. Beside it stood a reconstruction, an exact copy, but artificially filled in with the missing parts of the jaw and the cranium. Behind them glowing eerily in the museum's carefully crafted lighting, was an artist's attempt at reconstructing the face that had once covered this skull. It came from the rock shelter of La Ferracie, a place that Bruno Courage passed each day as he drove from his home to his office at the town hall of Saint-Denis, where for the past decade he had been the local chief of police in the Perigord region of France. 
The region boasted an extraordinary wealth of prehistoric remains, from painted caves to carvings, from the tusks of mammoths, and Bruno had become an enthusiast who visited most of the known caves and was a regular visitor to the Museum of Les Aisies, uh, close to his home where he now stood. And this face let, let me, set him thinking about one of the curious obsessions of his friend Jean-Jacques, known to the region's police as Jean as JJ, with another and more recent skull. Bruno knew this more recent skull very well, since its enlarged photograph had for three de decades accompanied Jean-Jacques's rise to become the chief of detectives for the department of the Dordogne. For as long as Bruno has, had known him, and for years before that, the photograph of the skull had gone with JJ to every office he'd occupied. These days, it was fixed to the back of, the, of JJ's door, where he could see the skull from his place at the imposing desk, standard issue for such a senior official. His visitors couldn't miss it when, uh, as whenever they left the room. Jean-Jacques claimed not to remember why he'd called the skull Oscar, but every policeman in France knew the story. A truffle hunter out with his dog in the woods near Saint-Denis had found a tree downed by a storm. The fallen trunk had blocked a small stream. The rushing water had eroded a bank and exposed something that had attracted the hunted, hunter's dog, a human foot, partly decomposed. There were no signs on the body of anything that could identify it. There were no clothes, there was absolutely nothing. Jean-Jacques spent an hour foraging for any sign of a bullet in the, in the soil beneath the body. At the post-mortem, he delved to try and find any sign of a knife wound upon the, upon the ribs. He challenged himself to try and find who this might be. And in almost desperation, he boiled the skull to remove the excess flesh and then found the sign of the murder. The body, the man had been killed with a blow from a camping tool. That had been the origins of all of this. And then Bruno was finding himself struck with wonder at the reality of this face that somebody had put onto this, these bones. What do you think of the expedition, of the exhibition, Bruno? You've been studying it long enough. The speaker was Clotilde Daumier, a short red-haired powerhouse of a woman who was one of the museum's curators, an expert on the local history and a very good friend of Bruno's. It's wonderful, said uh, Bruno. I'm, I'm just overwhelmed with the skill of these reconstructions. Well, tell the artist yourself, said Clotilde, and, uh, and, uh, and steered Bruno <clears throat> towards an attractive grey-haired woman who moved gracefully as she advanced to shake Bruno's hand. Elizabeth Daines, meet Bruno Courage, our chief of police and a good friend who has a great interest in archaeology. He even found a modern corpse in one of our ancient graves. Clotilde's archaeologist found it, Bruno said. I just helped find out who it was. Well, you're very kind, monsieur, to say to be uh, so polite about my reconstruction. Tell me, how did you know this corpse was not prehistoric that you found? Because he was wearing a swatch on his wrist, madame, and they only began in 1983. Tell me, have you ever worked with the police before in trying to reconstruct the faces of unidentified skeletons? A little, but only informally, she replied. It's a considerable investment in time and effort to do such a reconstruction. And many of the courts see our work as so much inspired guesswork. Why is that, Bruno said. Well, it's, it's partly because when you study the verbal inscriptions, descriptions that people give of strangers, they usually describe the hair, its style and color, and the color of the eyes, and whether the face is fleshy or lean, but those are the elements we cannot really discern from the skull itself. What we can do is to use the contours of the individual skull, which vary much more than you might think, even among close family members, to reconstruct each of the 43 muscles in the human face. So in terms of form and structure, we can go a long way to reconstruct the features. So the muscular structure of a face varies with the small differences in the shape of the skull. Exactly, she said. 
We use a laser measurement system to map the precise shape of each skull down to fractions of a millimeter and put that into a computer, which creates a three-dimensional model. Then we use a three high precision 3D printer to give us the head. And then we use the laser again to compare this printed skull with a cast we make of the original. That used to take a year of work, but now with the computers, it's almost automatic. And we can do so much of the work of recreating the musculature of the face by working with the computer. So Bruno asked, if you knew the hair color and that the body was that of a young man in his 20s, athletic and probably without much body fat. Could you reconstruct something, reconstruct something fairly accurate? Absolutely, Monsieur Bruno. Should I assume that you have a particular skeleton in mind and that you're hoping to enlist my help? Ha ha, and off we go. On the coldest case, 30 years old. And from then, obviously, in the book, The Coldest Case, Bruno goes on to, you know, the, the story goes on to find out who was the victim, you know, what happened to them and who was responsible and are they able to be brought to justice as well, obviously. And when one of the questions that came through before the event, Martin, was from Paul, who really enjoyed the book and wanted to know, did you do a lot of research for it? Now, from what you've already told us, you know, you've obviously got this rich environment around you that you can pull from and also your journalistic background. But what was the case for this book? Well, yes, I mean, that was the origin of it. And then I was, um, so I, I had all the prehistoric material in, uh, available. And I, I've met this woman, Elizabeth Daines, who really has recreated these faces. Um, but then in trying, to, in trying to think, who might it have been some 30 years ago? Um, I began to think uh, about my own knowledge of those years when I was based in Moscow. Um, the end of the Cold War, the final years, the fall of the Berlin Wall, this extraordinary period that, that we went through then. And one of the great mysteries of this last act of the Cold War was something called the Rosenholz dossier. And it was the master file of all of the agents of the Stasi, East German intelligence. And somehow in those confused days after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the CIA got hold of the whole thing. And some say that it was traded for immunity for some of the old East German buses. Some say they got it for $75,000, which would have been the best deal America ever made since they bought Manhattan from the Indians. Um, but what was interesting was the Americans began sharing some of this information. And naturally, they shared a lot with the Brits, who are very, very close intelligence allies with the Americans and always have been. And what we found, what the British found, was that almost all of the names for Stasi spies, or alleged Stasi, Stasi contacts in Britain, were well-meaning peaceniks. I mean, people in CND and Ban the Bomb, people who were seen as sort of sympathetic to world peace, um, but no evidence whatsoever that there'd been anything like agents. And it was quite probable that the Stasi guys were padding out their expenses by putting down various names as possible agents without much basis to it. But there were in other countries, particularly in Germany and in Scandinavia, some pretty high ranking people who were uh, fingered, exposed, if you like, by this Rosenholz dossier. And there were various scandals in Germany and in the NATO headquarters where several very senior advisors were found to have been in the pay of, of Stasi. Um, and what was particularly interesting for the French was that whereas the Americans shared the British bits with the Brits, the German bits with the Germans, the Swedish bits with the Swedes, they wouldn't share with the French. Now, there's a very long history of animosity between French and American intelligence, some of it going back to World War II and the, the French doubts about Charles de Gaulle. But I came across one particular story which always fascinated me, that there was actually a French espionage agent. He was the, the main liaison man in Washington with, Amer with the CIA and American intelligence, who actually applied for and got protection uh, sanctuary in the USA because he was terrified that his own French colleagues would kill him. They'd called him back to France, he refused to go, the Americans gave him sanctuary. 
And this was back in the time of de Gaulle when the Americans were trying to alert de Gaulle himself. JFK, John Kennedy, wrote a hand, did a handwritten letter to de Gaulle saying, look, we've got a defector who's telling us about X and Y and Z in your government. And de Gaulle was very, very skeptical. And uh, so all of this I, I've just been fascinated about for years. I've always loved the John le Carré novels and this touch of real life intelligence inspiring. I just thought this fits in time wise to my Oscar or to, to Raymond's Oscar. And so I began to put all of this together and I was writing it at a time of a real heat wave in southern France and lots of alarms about forest fires and so on. Um, and we, hundreds of thousands of, of acres were, were burned out in, uh, in southern France. And there were lots of panics about it. And so I, I wanted to bring that in as well, because when you get a heat wave in this part of France, it really is hot. We had something called the Canicule, and they reckon about 30,000 elderly people died because of the heat. So um, all of that came into it as well. And including one of my favorite chateaus, which has a museum of the art of war of the Middle Ages. Uh, and then of course, there's the wine and the food of the Perigord, because Bruno loves to cook. People of the Perigord reckon that they are living in the, and I agree with them, the gastronomic heartland of France. And we have the wonderful wines of the region, the wines of Bejerac, of Montréal, of Montbazillac. And so, cheers to you all. I love that. And I just wanted to share with you, Martin, that Anne has said it was a terrific reading. But she also asked, like, how does your friend feel about that story, that case being part of your book? Well, Raymond was delighted that at last he thought Oscar was getting a decent recognition or a decent burial. But I was always a bit nervous when uh, my books began to come out translated into French. Because until then, you know, whenever we'd had a, a new Bruno book was being published, uh, I'd organized, my wife and I would organize a dinner party. And we'd have Raymond and the Baron and Pierrot, the policeman and the mayor and their wives. And I would sort of say, you know, well, after the first course, I'd tap a glass with a knife and say, well, dear friends, we're here celebrating the birth of another of my novels of this particular part of the world. And in this novel, I talk of the beauty of the women of the Perigord, of the intelligence of the men. Oui, 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 Martin, more wine, more wine. And so I was, I was a bit worried um, as to what they would think when they actually read it in French. And I, you know, I had, I wouldn't say nightmares, but I certainly thought, will they ride me out of town on a rail or, but no, in fact, they, they, they turn out to, to really rather enjoy it. And Pierrot found himself becoming a kind of a tourist icon. Um, because, you know, on, on market day, we'd get tourists from Germany or Britain or the USA or Italy or Turkey, Japan, and they would come into the market square of, uh, of the town where I live and they would be looking around for a policeman and their eyes would fall upon Bruno and they would go up to him and say, um, uh, Monsieur, êtes-vous Bruno? And he would say, yes, yavol, moi. And he would sign the books for them and he would stand and have selfies taken with the women. So and he just loved it. I mean, he thought that was great. The mayor thought it was terrific. And um, the next thing I knew was that the, um, the French government had given me a gold medal for my services to tourism. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's like a, an extra thing as an author, you're getting people to come and visit where you are. And one of the things when you were just saying there, Martin, about those amazing dinner parties, which sound wonderful, do you ever do those guess the wine that you have in your book, where, which I thought was a, I'd love that idea. Everyone tries it and tries to guess what region it's from. Is that something you'd ever do at those evenings? Oh, you bet, you bet. I mean, wine is a very important part of life here. So much so, that I now have my own wine, a Cuvée Bruno, it's called. And here is Bruno's dog, the, the Basset Hound. Of course. The Pistons Homewood. And we make about 8,000 bottles a year uh, of this and they, uh, they all sell. Um, and uh, we have the, the, uh, the, the 
the Consular de la Vine de Bejerac, the organization behind the wines of Bejerac, was founded by an English king in the year 1254, because this part of France was being ruled by the English, who were then the Dukes of Aquitaine for about 300 years. And um, so that organization, the Consular, is still in existence. And I am a Grand Consul of the Vine de Bejerac. Uh, which is, I think, the first time an Englishman has, or a Brit has been a Grand Consul pretty much since we were thrown out in the year 1457 by, uh, by the French. Um, and yes, and I write about wine a lot. I write about it for German magazines and for an English language paper here, and, um, which is why the last couple of days I've been tied up on the jury. We've been selecting the gold medals for the, uh, for the Bejerac wines at the moment. It's a tough job, but somebody has Someone to do Someone has it. to do it, Martin, and, you know, they asked you. I don't blame you for wanting to. And you just touched upon, obviously, your own passion for food and wine like Bruno. And obviously, your, you and your wife have written cookbooks together, which are uh, referred to in the books. How did that all come about, you, you both working well, together? it came that? about because, um, um, for some reason, Bruno really took off in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. And uh, for the last three years, Bruno has been number one uh, in the bestseller list of all three countries. And people in, um, in those countries began writing to my German publisher and saying, um, we really like the food in these books. Uh, when can we have a Bruno cookbook? So I am a very amateur cook. My wife, Julia, is a terrific, a terrific cook. She was a food writer for at the Washington Post and at United Press International, and she still writes a regular food column on, uh, on substack.com, uh, Julia Watson. And so we produced the first cookbook, which is called Bruno's Cookbook, um, and it... Um, um, Julia did the recipes and I wrote the twiddly bits you know, between the recipes and uh, we had wonderful photographs from uh, uh, a great German photographer and it, um, it sold 100,000 copies in Germany and it won the prize from Gourmet International. As Was it like the best world's cook best French cookbook for 20 years? Yeah. Was that the one you were going to say? What can I say? Um, so then we wrote the second, the second cookbook, which is Bruno's Garden Cookbook, with a lot about our, our garden as well. And that also won another prize. So, um, and now the good news is that the Bruno Cookbook is going to be coming out next year in English at last. So um, all of these great recipes for confit de canard and lapin au moutarde and uh, poulet au verjus will be available to, uh, to everybody. And the food really here really is true. And you know, a moment ago, also you were showing the, the wine. Um, someone's asked, do you have your own wine cellar there in France? Oh, yeah. Well, I do. I have, um, I have, a, I have a, a section where I keep sort of my ready wine for that night or the next two or three days. And then I have a, a, a wine cellar. Uh, it's, it's hard to have an actual cellar here because the, the water level is quite high. So I have one large section of, uh, of, of an old house, which is stone built. And so the temperature is quite cool all the time where I keep uh, most of my wine. And then under the steps of the pigeon tower, I keep, uh, I keep the freshest stuff. And um, I very much enjoy having this much wine in my life. And uh, I could hardly think of writing Bruno without a, a glass of good Bejerac wine in my to hand. And wine and good food. Um, Martin, what more could you want? It's perfect, isn't it? Um, actually, Frankie, before the event, also asked, obviously, in your series of books, the town is fictitious. Can you confirm what town it's based on? Well, it's it's about 75% of it is based upon a town called Le Bug. They suspected is, that might be. I live right near it. I mean, um, but... Um, I thought it would be, first of all, I didn't like, I don't like the church in Le Bug, so I brought in a church from Tremola, which is a wonderful 12th century church, and then I brought in, I modified the story of the bridge, I did talk about, I did bring in the real market and so on, um, but I've, and I put a map in the front of the book, which is, again, about 75-80% Le Bug, but the rest of it is is pure invention, so just as um, 
I, uh, I invented the name, well, Julia, uh, in fact, invented the name of Bruno. When I first wrote the first draft of my first one, um, I, I called him Pierrot throughout. And then I thought I'd better change the name just to be, you know, to put a copyright and all sorts of things. Maybe I should call him another French name, Gaston or something. And Julia, who had worked in publishing, said, she said two things. She said, first of all, she said, uh, you might um, you might find an international sale for these books. So he'd better have an international name, one that works in different languages. How about Bruno? Hmm. So I picked the name Bruno. And um, then she said, now, another thing about publishers is that they do like the idea of a series because it means that they can carry on selling. So go away and write five paragraphs to sum up each of the next five Bruno novels you'll be doing in this series. Oui, madame. I mean, uh, my Julia is always right. So uh, I went off and I did that. And next thing we knew, we'd sold the novel, the, the series in... America, Holland, Germany, Italy, ah, it was you know, off we went and now it's 18 languages. So. Was that fantastic when you first got that news that you just- It was unbelievable. I mean, I almost fell over. Um, and, uh, um, but again, it was Julia. And in fact, Julia is behind so much of all of this, not just the cookbook, not just the name and the books, but also we wouldn't have been here without Julia. We used to come, we used to come here in the 1980s and 90s um, to stay with some friends who'd, who'd settled here, <clears throat> a French wife and uh, an English guy who'd been a journalist, and they were very good friends. And um, in fact, when they first moved here, uh, they were, Michael, uh, Michael and I were rebuilding the terrace of this old house that they'd, they'd got. I think Gabrielle had inherited it. She's a French woman. And uh, uh, Julio and, and Gabrielle were cooking up wonderful meals and our newborn babies, our little Kate and their little Olivia were rolling around stark naked on the grass and so on. It was a wonderful time. And then when we were in Moscow, the story was terrific for a journalist, but the food was terrible, terrible. So the chance to go and see our friends in the Perigord for a couple of weeks in the summer was perfect. And then we, um, we'd, been, we'd been moved to the States Julia and uh, I was in based in Washington for the Guardian and Julia and the girls were in uh, in the Perigord with our friends and I had to be back in Washington there was a big conference going on and I set up a, a interview with Bill Clinton in the White House uh, I had known, known Clinton since we were at Oxford together so uh, I could get an interview with him and I would fly on Air Force One and so on but I was standing outside the Oval Office, about to go in, and my, my mobile phone rang. Now, in those days, we're talking, you know, the late 90s, mobile phones were pretty big. They were like bricks. And um, it, it, this thing rings, I hold it, it's Julia. She says, I don't care what you're doing. She says, I want you to get on the next plane back to France. I have found our house. At this point, I didn't really know we were looking for a house. In Is it all a big surprise to you? Julia had said, you know, we ought to have some sort of base for the children that roots because we're foreign correspondents. Anyway, so uh, I said, well, you know, Bill Clinton, president, interview. But a few days later, I was on a plane back to France and... This is the house she found. We've been here ever since. And without this house, there wouldn't have been Bruno. There wouldn't have been cookbooks. There wouldn't have been Bruno wine and so on and so forth. So it's really all Julia. And obviously you're talking about your wife though and your family. I believe they're really very supportive and they're the first people that read your manuscripts. Are you ever worried about what they might say? Um... Yes, of course I am. I mean, I hope that they enjoy it. They, they often come up with very, very, very smart ideas. Um, and they, they often, you know, they, they, they have a very good sense of what Bruno should do as a person and what his friends should do. And I, I really depend upon them quite a lot to, to, to steer me because it's very hard when you just finished a draft of a novel it's very hard to be objective about it yourself mm. and to have somebody saying, you know, boom, 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 you know, this is, this doesn't work or this should be different. That's extremely useful. And so, yeah, without Julia, Kate and Fan, we'd, you know, we would, I, I'd have been much, much, much worse state, but it's, uh, you know, the thing about when you are writing, in a, you always are alone. 
you're completely alone when you're right. You're there in your head with your characters, with your invention. And so I've always liked doing readings and meeting readers and getting to know, you know other people and doing events like this because it, you're no longer alone. You're reaching out in a sense. But thanks to Julia and the girls and some other friends, I, I, I have this, this sense of, um, of not being that alone. And also the people around Bruno, because it's not just him, it's, it's all of the community that he's involved with. It's Jean-Jacques, it's Isabelle, it's the mayor, it's, uh, it's Pamela, it's Fabio the doctor, it's Gilles. All of these people he's constantly with and they're horse riding together, they're hunting together, they're cooking together. Um, they also become like a, I don't know, like a group of friends in a way. They're almost as real as the real thing. It's a very strange thing when you you produce you know, this many novels around the same group of characters. It's um, it's like my own little soap opera that I'm I'm living in. And like the characters, the writers, they become really vivid and real. When you talked about Bruno, actually, we had a question from Tony, where obviously looking at Bruno as as a real person, he's asked, "What do you think he would make of Britex?" Of which? Of Brixex, of, of us leaving the European Union, England. Oh, oh Brexit. Oh, yeah. he thinks, what did I say? He thinks, he thinks we're crazy, um, particularly <laughs> because he, he's got to meet, got to know quite a lot of the Brits who, who have settled in this area, uh, and many of whom are, you know, are good local citizens. You know, we've had, until Brexit, we had various British citizens who were sitting on local councils elected to be uh, to be local councillors um, and I mean the French have been extraordinarily welcoming to us over the years and so Brexit has really it's it's just put in so many difficulties into life for example I've only just had one copy to see of my new novel that has already been out for a couple of weeks because normally you know an author gets a, a dozen copies from his publisher yeah. No, no, they're still held up in the customs because of Brexit. And I know other authors who had a similar, similar problem with this. And it's like, uh, like those poor guys in the fisheries, you know, who are finding they have got problems with this as well. And um, I, uh, I don't want to get into politics on all of this, but the, the French just think we've lost our minds. Except that the French are also more skeptical about the European Union than almost any other country. There was a poll that was done this week by the European uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and they found that the French are now the most skeptical about Europe. And remember, when the French had a referendum about the, the Versailles Treaty, about the, the Lisbon Treaty, they voted no. Um, and the French government, of course, paid no attention to that referendum result, just as the Irish government twice paid no attention to their referendum results. Um, but the British government paid better attention to theirs. So that's politics, I guess. Well, I, I knew it would might, might be a slightly dicey question because obviously, you know, in this country, it's very much an equal divide, isn't it? Um, yeah. In the UK, it was such a close referendum and one of the things when we're talking about Bruno is like a person a character that you all you know that may you know you have thoughts when he's talking to you has he ever done anything in the series that surprised you and you've gone oh, no. what are you doing has he oh. totally taken you unawares absolutely I mean there's there were there were times when for an author characters get out of your control so there was there was one novel I wrote that the devil's cave and the Germans had a much better title for it. They called it Femme Fatale, because there was a very dangerous woman in this particular novel. And this dangerous woman wanted for her own nefarious purposes to seduce Bruno to get him over onto her side. Now in my plan for the novel, and I, I, plan, it, I plan a novel out quite seriously. In my plan, I was gonna say, well, you know, Bruno, he's just a guy. A beautiful woman comes onto him, makes it very clear that she what she wants him. He's only a guy. He's going to succumb to her wicked ways and her wiles. But when I came to write this particular chapter, it was like a force field began to come out of my desk. At me. And it was as if he was saying, I am not going to drop my trousers for this woman. 
and I thought, crikey, he's got a life of his own. Yeah, he's, <laughs> was, like, he's gone, he's changed it, the it outline already. It was a moment for a writer. It can be a bit of a panic, isn't it, when um, authors have already said this to me, you know, it's a wonderful thing, but then you're also like, okay, what do I do now? Because Absolutely. they're not cooperating with the story. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, obviously those that are watching that are aspiring writers, we've got two questions around that. One from Joel about, like, what kind of hobbies do you think would be good to develop as writers? And also, like, generally, another question about advice for aspiring writers. Would, is there any tips that you would recommend? Yeah, um, one of the the best tips I know about writing is something I picked up from the letters of Ernest Hemingway. And uh, he was writing to uh, Scott Fitzgerald, who his friend, the guy author of The Great Gatsby, and Fitzgerald was going through a writer's block. And, and Hemingway wrote, well, look, you know, Scott, that I write 300 words a day every day no matter what and what I also do is I never stop for the day at the end of a chapter I never even stop at the end of a paragraph nor at the end of a sentence I'll stop in the middle of a phrase because it's so much easier to start again the next day that's brilliant advice that's the best advice I've ever come across for an author just keep on writing and like hobbies wise, I guess to practice the craft of writing. And I, I think a lot of the time people say read like, you know, the more you read, the more you're able to anticipate what will make a good book. Well, yeah, um, difficulty is that many people, many people I find and I've been guilty of this in my time, tend to read a particular kind of book. They like to read spy stories or crime stories or romances or whatever. And I think it's, I don't know, I found it useful to just keep on reading lots of different things. So I read a lot of nonfiction, a lot of history. Um, I, because I keep on trying to improve my French, I'm reading various French novels and you know, Balzac and, and, and Dumas and so on. Um, and I always go back to Dickens. I mean, among my favorite writers, I mean, obviously I adore the Carré spy stuff. I, I, I really admire, uh, Ian Rankin on on, on mm. Scotland. I adore Sherlock Holmes as the the classic mystery, but I I go back to Dickens a, a lot for those characters and those descriptions and um and it's uh, I just say keep on reading widely as you can. And actually, um, we did have a question from Wendy about your favourite authors. So would you say it was Dickens, Ian Rankin, the the people you've just mentioned? I think it is, yeah, I think it's pretty much Dickens. I mean, I put Balzac up with him quite high, the French French contemporary, as it were, of, of, of Dickens. Um, and I don't know, there's a sense that in those days there were classics. And I'm mm. just, I often wonder what books that are being published these days will be thought of by our great grandchildren as classics of our day. And it's, uh, it's interesting to, 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 to think about that. And it's, I mean, I'm not sure how many of our current writers will live. I, I hope, I hope quite a few of them, because after all, these really are interesting times. And if writers can't mm. give a sense of them, what are we here for? I love what you just said, because we, we have a, dis a lot of the people that are probably watching at the moment know that a lot of our author talks are under our discoveries as we develop a library and I'm involved with that. Our online book group this week was literally contemplating that that question, Martin, of what will become the next timeless classic of this time. So it's quite surreal that you mentioned it as well. I'm going to be pondering that now. Um, well, we were... my, one of my candidates is Harry Potter. Mm. I, I think children a hundred years from now are likely to be reading Harry Potter. And like they'll, they'll probably still have all the merchandise for people to buy, so it'll go forever, won't <laughs> they'll it? They'll be antiques, valuable by those in those days. Collect them now. Your great grandchildren will thank you for it. <laughs> I like that. That's wonderful. I mean, our time is absolutely whizzing by, Martin. I just wanted to finish with the last question, which is for you. What's one of the best things about being an author? What What do you love most about it, or one of the things? I. It's it's the the sense of 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 
opening a book, a brand new book that you've written and smelling it and thinking, I did that. Uh, it wouldn't be here but for me. But it's 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 also um, it, it it it's also a sense of you know I watch time pass with the number of my books spreading along a shelf kind of thing. Um, my mum always said to me when I was a little boy, you know, life is short, the world is big, go out and see as much of it as you can. And I've been lucky to have done a lot of that, but equally to have had different kinds of life in different countries, different careers. And here I am, you know, much older now, and I've got this whole new career as a, a writer of these stories set in France and cookbooks. Love it. No, it's it's extraordinary and amazing advice from your arm. I love that. And as you've been talking about this evening, obviously Martin's latest book, The Coldest Case, it's out now. Do check it out. And I'd just like to finish by thanking everyone for joining us this evening. Um, as a charity, we're always so grateful for your support from attending a great events like this to borrowing our books, we're open, um, and donating to us. You can find out more about all our amazing services and ways to support us on our website. And to be the first to hear about all our upcoming North events, there's another five this month. Do join our online Facebook group, Discoveries, which you'll be directed to when I end this live event. And you can also find details of all our online events on our Suffolk Library's website and Eventbrite. So thank you all again for coming. And Martin, a huge thanks for your time this evening. It's been such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great fun. I enjoyed it.